Hello and welcome to Reading Aloud. I'm standing on the balcony of the Old Midland Bank here in the centre of Birmingham. A beautiful listed building, now a bookstore. But that connection with money is spot on for today's programme because we've got lots of it. Yes, in this week's programme, Millions, the movie. How a family film became a best-selling book and then inspired some magical work in the classroom. And Diamond recalls a very special teacher. She chose books that deliberately had very good, catchy beginnings. Um, ones that were magical, that took you into another world. And we uncover the secret life of Hans Christian Andersen. But first, Millions, a new book that's proving popular with teachers and their pupils. It began life as a movie. It's the story of two boys who discover a big bag of cash which sets them on the adventure of a lifetime. soon learn that true wealth has nothing to do with money. Where'd you get that? You can see it too, then. Well, you know, sometimes you see things, don't you? And other people can't see them. Frank Cottrell Boyce, who wrote the screenplay and then the book, loves meeting his young readers at events like this at Birmingham Central Library. What inspired you to actually write this book? The idea of a story that starts with somebody finding a bag of money is actually a very old idea. There's a story like that in Canterbury Tales, which is by Geoffrey Chaucer, which was written in like 1480 something. And I was quite interested in doing that story with children because you have advertising and stuff aimed at you. When I was little, if that had happened, people would have wanted um, a pony or a boat or something like that. It was when we were auditioning people for the film and we asked them what they'd do with the money, they all knew exactly what they wanted to do with the money. All the boys wanted an Xbox or a Game Boy. See this house? We could buy two like that. If they knocked them off the asking price. And if we did buy property, that would go up in value, so we'd have even more money. I think what was good about it was that I absolutely knew that the story worked because I'd worked on the screenplay all that time and I knew what order events should come in. And I guess what was hard was having to write He Said because, of course, you never, in all your career as a screenwriter, have to write He Said. And I, it, I became, it became a kind of real... Um, mania with me. I'd get to the end of a page and look at the page and all these saids were sort of jumping out. You just seem to be repeating yourself so much, which is a really obvious thing. I think the film really looks at what money could actually do. It's not like they go out and splurge it all on a simple thing. They really come to understand just how vast and complicated a thing money is and how it completely takes them over. The money swamps them. The book's moral tale has been picked up by one teacher here at St Joseph's Roman Catholic Junior School in Birmingham. Melinda Fabro is not only reading millions with the class, she's also devised a whole range of activities around the theme of money using characters from the book. Today we're going to be doing an activity about how you might spend this money or what you think Damien and his brother Anthony should do with all this money they find. What does it do to them when you actually bring in a big stack of stuff that actually looks like money, or right, it isn't, but it looks like it? Oh, their eyes pop open wide. <laughs> their jaws drop open. Um, they're very disappointed to hear that it was fake money and they weren't allowed to take it with right. them when they left. Having teased the class with a big bag of cash, Melinda got the children brainstorming a money mind map. Millions of sweets. What are you going to do with millions of sweets? Eat them all. I thought about no more school. Bling, bling. Bling, bling. The first thing that came to Daddy's mind was bling, bling. Before I start handing out this cash, I want to brainstorm a few ideas about what we might spend this cash on. Trace. You need food to survive. Iman. Clothes. Peter. Cars. Dominic. A diamond ring. Who are you going to buy a diamond ring for? Miss Fafo. Best student ever. We've brainstormed different sort of ideas of what we must spend this money on. I'm going to be dropping on your tables 40,000 pounds. So you're going to have to decide what you're going to buy. What you'll have to do is use one of those papers to keep track of your spending. So can you take a minute right now and decide who in your group is going to be the accountant? They were supposed to work as a group and sort of agree on yes. the list of items, but of course the dominant uh, personalities come out and say, no, we're spending it like this. Both 
It was interesting when we were doing the project because the things that they thought that they could buy were just extraordinary. You know, they were going to buy mansions and cars and dolphins and aquariums and <laughs> and it was really like, you know, at 10,000 pounds isn't going to go that far. <laughs> and at the end, we just thought, because we had 27,500 left, we'd buy a cinema for 20,000. Do you have any money away? No. No. <laughs> and Damien's buying statues and wants to do all this sort of, you know, donate to charity and whatnot with the money and they're sort of thinking, why? What's he doing that for? <laughs> now, the children in your school, they're Catholic, mm. and Damien's Catholic, so was there some kind of rapport going on there? I think they were actually quite fascinated with Damien's attitude towards saints, um, and just the fact that he's naming them all the time. Claire of Assisi, 1194 till 1253. I was like, human television. You're the patron saint of television? Keeps me busy. They were amazed that there could possibly be a patron saint of television and quite excited at that. So when you put all that together, what do you think the children got out of it? I think the kids just get a better understanding of the book itself. They get excited to read. I mean, now every day they're asking me, when are we going to read millions? When are we going to read millions? And partly that's because you've asked the children to be Damien. That's the magic leap, isn't it? Yeah, I think they feel now that they've sort of invested a bit of themselves into this story and they're, you know, wanting to see how it's going to play out. I want all the money back in the bag. Quickly, all of it, Dominic. I'm watching you. And now, hallelujah, we praise those teachers who inspire reading. TV presenter Anne Diamond had one such evangelical English teacher and she's never been able to look at a wardrobe in the same way again. We had a teacher at our school who used to read to us the first couple of chapters of a good book and uh, hope that it would inspire us enough to read the end ourselves. And I remember her reading the first chapter of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, and I must have been about eight, and it absolutely fired my imagination. She chose books that deliberately had very good, catchy beginnings, um, ones that were magical, that took you into another world. Um, and then she left you at the doorway of this new world, literally at the, at the back of the wardrobe, waiting to go into the forest. And I spent the whole of my childhood checking the backs of wardrobes just to see, just in case, the magic was real. She took a step further in, then two or three steps, always expecting to feel woodwork against the tips of her fingers. But she could not feel it. Next moment, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer soft fur, but something hard and rough, even prickly. Why, it is just like branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at night time with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. As soon as I had children, one of the delights that I really looked forward to was reading to them The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe again and watching the same fire light up in their eyes. Um, uh, I just love it. It's a brilliant, brilliantly written book. The author of that book, C.S. Lewis, once said, fairy stories may say best what's to be said. Of course, the master of fairy tale writing must be Hans Christian Andersen. He wrote over 160 of them, tales like The Red Shoes, The Little Mermaid, The Emperor's New Clothes and The Ugly Duckling. At last, Big Egg cracked. Peep, peep, said the young one as he tumbled out. But how big and ugly he was. There's a fine family, said the old duck. All the children are pretty, except that grey one. He won't do it all. The Ugly Duckling there, a story we all know, but there's another story, the story of Hans Christian Andersen himself, and we've been reading a biography by Jackie Wulschläger called The Life of a Storyteller. Some unfamiliar things here, Julia. Perhaps uh, not a side of Hans Christian Andersen that many of us knew about until Jackie found them. Well, no, um, but it does give a wonderful picture, A, of this difficult, unhappy man who came from a very impoverished childhood and 
then became the sort of toast of the whole of Europe, really. It started in Denmark and then spread. But also it gives a wonderful picture of the Danish society, which was obviously absolutely tiny. Everybody knew everybody. Um, and he set his cap at rising to the very top of it. It surprised me just how much of a sad person he must have been. He obviously did very well to get anywhere in life, considering the start that he had an illiterate, uh, alcoholic mother, um, a father who died when he was quite young. So he did do well, but I think there's, there's one quote in the book which is something along the lines of, um, I seek honour more than gold. And it just struck me, yeah, you sought honour, but you didn't really give yourself a chance to develop your own life at all. And I think he died rather sad, rather frustrated, without really knowing who he was himself, um, but having left a legacy of some wonderful stories. Now, you presumably know the stories. We all know some of the stories. Reading a book like this, does it cast a light on the way we read those stories? I don't think it changes the story at all. I think the stories stand alone and have their own merit. But I, I do think, actually, having found out about him, in, in the detail that we did in this book um, has certainly made me look at him in a very different way. Yes, we start seeing some themes through the stories mm. of the outsider, the person who's uh, repressed in mm. one way or another. Has it changed your view of the stories at all, Julia? Not of the stories, because I think I've always thought the stories had a kind of black heart. But I think it's very interesting that somebody who had such a sort of poor childhood himself should ever have thought he wanted to write stories for children. That seems to me a strange thing. But I think that came from him never having actually left his childhood. He seemed to remain stuck in his childhood and uh, he was much happier when he was with younger people and, and made a lot of friendships. He a lot of children as well, didn't he? He certainly did. The years. Well, of course, effectively, he ran away from home aged 14 and ran to Copenhagen from this little provincial Island and was going to make his way in the theatre at that stage. I mean, it's a bit like I'm a celebrity, you know. He was <laughs> yeah. determined in Danish terms, he would have been on Big Brother, you know. He was determined yeah. to be a star yeah. in some way. Now, this is a book that I think can claim to have revealed for the first time that Hans Christian Andersen was gay. Mm -hmm. Is that does that matter? Is that interesting? So, we stories in schools and storytelling? No, not in the slightest. Um, I, if people want to know that about somebody and the information is there, then fine. But, you know, if at any point it's going to make any difference, we shouldn't really be pursuing it that way. He was a great storyteller. That's what should be standing up. It doesn't change what you think about the stories, but it is extremely interesting mm -hmm. to know who was this guy? Why did he write these stories? Why do they work so well as stories for children? Or do they work much beyond that? Ah, now this is interesting because we only know in this country usually about 20, 25 mm. stories mm. of Hans Christian Andersen. Mm. One of the things this book did for me was to send me into looking at some of these other stories mm -hmm. that are really very adult. I mean, a story like The Shadow, about mm. a, a man whose shadow takes him over. I mean, it's a bit like you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, isn't it? I suppose one of the interesting things to ask is, what would Hans Christian Andersen feel about the fact that he is remembered as the author of a dozen, half a dozen wonderful fairy stories and not remembered for his adult writing? I suspect he'd be absolutely heartbroken. Well, I think he'd just be happy to know that he's been remembered. And famous. And famous. And famous, <laughs> and famous <laughs> absolutely. The other side of Hans Christian Andersen. For me, the great Dane suffered an irredeemable blow once the sickly and slightly creepy Danny Kaye wrapped his voice around, there once was an ugly duckling, which seemed to be played almost once a week on BBC's children's favourites when I was a kid. Enough upsetting nostalgia. See you next time.